This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Hey everyone, Jeremy here. And guys, I'm very excited for the conversation we're going to have today. So we have Colonel Douglas McGregor with us today. He's a retired U.S. Army colonel, best-selling author, and really, in my opinion, he's one of the most important voices in the current world we live in we need to be listening to. So Colonel McGregor, thank you so much for your time today, sir. Sure, of course. So I wanted to start out first and foremost because one of the about the war in Ukraine, you've been one of the different voices from the beginning, right? You said it's going to be a quick conflict. And to this point, it, it continues to keep dragging out. And I was more of your your opinion that it was going to be over fast. I don't see how it keeps going. So looking at the conflict, when does this conflict end and why has it drug on so long? We need to understand that uh, most of us who knew something about the Russians expected them to come in with a vengeance and try to end this as quickly as possible. We, of course, were not privileged to be on the distribution list for the Russian general staff. So we had not looked at the guidance provided by President Putin and his larger intention. And his his initial intention was to go in with a very small force. Remember, he had been spending about 15 years trying to persuade everyone in NATO not to advance NATO any, any closer to Russia's borders. In fact, I guess you could probably argue that he'd been at it for 20 years. But nevertheless... He made that very, very clear, and he was very alarmed by the steps that we were taking to militarize Eastern Europe. You know, we put in these uh, missile sites, which we said were anti-missile sites designed to cope with an attack from Iran, which, of course, was absurd. There's no reason for the Iranians to attack the Europeans. And uh, these sites were in Romania and Poland, and he interpreted this as clear and unambiguous evidence that we were trying to move these uh, missiles that we were planning to use closer to his border. At the same time, you had this turnover in the government through a coup that was largely CIA-backed and sponsored by Washington that put uh, this so-called Maidan revolution into power. And this was a radical nationalist uh, group that was determined to ultimately wage war on Russia. Uh, remember that up until this point, uh, Russians had been treated routinely as uh, second or third class citizens. They were not equal before the law. They were the, the objects of derision. Uh, they were living uh, in terrible poverty. As a result, you know, Putin said this is unacceptable. So when the revolution occurred and they installed this new radical government, that's when he took Crimea. And he seized Crimea, not simply because it it occurred to him in the middle of the night and he was trying to expand to the West. Crimea was historically Russian, never Ukrainian. That was an accident of uh, the 1950s when it was consigned to the Ukrainian Communist Party by the Russian Communist Party when Khrushchev was thoroughly drunk and uh, decided to do a favor for his buddies. Uh, Ultimately, uh, Putin was concerned that Crimea would very rapidly become a NATO naval base. From that point forward, we decided that we were going to, quote unquote, punish Russia for this breach of international law as though we had never broken international law at will ourselves. And uh, the hostilities between Ukraine and Russia broke out almost immediately. And certainly before the invasion of eastern Ukraine took place on 22 February uh, last year in 2022, 14,000 people had been killed in the fighting started by the Ukrainian nationalists against the Russians in the two provinces, Luhansk and Donetsk, uh, that said, look, we're tired of being treated badly. And they actually begged for Putin and Russia to intervene on their behalf, which Putin would not do. And then they wanted to become part of Russia, and Putin said, no, you're part of Ukraine. But uh, he watched this unfolding disaster with great concern. And then he also began to see us build up this Ukrainian army into a very powerful offensive force that could have only one purpose, which was to attack Russia. And he calculated it was only a matter of time until the missiles that he'd seen in Poland and Romania would show up in eastern Ukraine. 
much as uh, we we feared similar things in Cuba in 1963. So he decided I've got to intervene. But he said three things. First of all, <clears throat> the Ukrainians are our brothers. They are also Slavic Orthodox Christians. We don't want to kill large numbers of Ukrainians. That's not our point. Number two, I'm trying to signal the West that I'm serious. And he was confident that uh, the Washington and its allies would be alarmed by this and say, look, let's stop. Let's negotiate an end to this to avoid a war. Obviously, he was wrong. And uh, that's why the war has lasted as long as it did, because he persisted all the way through March into April. And as I'm sure some of your listeners will remember, Zelensky's negotiating team had actually reached the point <clears throat> where they were willing to accept neutrality which was one of the key issues for Putin. Frankly, he doesn't want Ukraine. He doesn't want to have to govern the place. He knows the people in Western Ukraine really are thoroughly Ukrainian, and they utterly hate and despise Russians. He's not foolish. He doesn't want to have anything to do with that. But the people in West, in Eastern Ukraine, most of them, particularly in the south of Eastern Ukraine, are Russians. And uh, he was interested in protecting them. And, and you also remember the Minsk Accords, they were designed to reassure the Russians that they would be members of this new Ukraine that would include both Ukrainians and Russian citizens of Ukraine. Uh, that, of course, all fell apart. And he discovered later on, by, thanks to Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, the whole Minsk Accord uh, operation was simply a delay tactic mm -hmm. to provide the Ukrainians with more time to build up their forces. Everything comes to a halt in April because Boris Johnson rides in on a cyclone and tells Kerensky and his friends, uh, Washington doesn't want a deal. We want the war to go on. And by the way, Zelensky, we will give you everything. You'll have the entire scientific, industrial, and military might of the United States and NATO behind you. You're going to win this war. I think Zelensky believed it, decided very well that we will wage war. And the Russians, in the meantime, decided, well, if we're going to have a major war with these people, which is what it looked like in April, that we don't have enough forces. And I think that's an important point for your listeners to understand. The Russian army of February 2022, in terms of its regular formations, was about 220,000, whereas the U.S. army at the same time was 470,000 in terms of regular army formations. And that was hopelessly inadequate for what his generals, that is Putin's generals, said that they were being asked to do. So they made a decision to go over to the strategic defense as an economy of force measure, to take control of those areas which were Russian in southern Ukraine. Uh, they actually pulled out of the ones uh, south of the west of the river in Kherson to tighten their control over the area in the east and also to shorten their defensive lines. And then they mounted a defense. And they prepared it in depth over many, many months. At the same time, he mobilized over 340,000 reservists, had another 80,000 volunteers who came out of the woodwork to volunteer to fight in this war for Russia. And uh, that process went on through uh, the fall to ensure that these troops were adequately trained and ready to go. Well, the winter was supposed to be the time when they could conceivably launch an offensive but they never got the freeze in the ground that was essential to sustain an offensive operation on land. In that part of the world, you have some of the most fertile farm country anywhere you're going to find in, in the globe, but at the same time, it's, it's very rich and deep. So you've got about 15, 20 feet deep of this black earth that's very rich that turns into some of the worst mud you've ever seen in your life. And whenever the muddy season begins, there isn't much movement off-road anywhere in Russia or Ukraine. Well, the problem was that uh, this off-road movement was made impossible, and that meant that uh, you were going to have to sit in your defenses and wait for things to freeze. Well, they didn't freeze. But at the same time, the Ukrainians then had built themselves up considerably, had received thousands of tanks and armored fighting vehicles, and probably fifteen to 20,000 foreign fighters anyway, plus all the intelligence that we could provide them. And they began attacking these defenses. And that has continued all the way through June and into July. And now as we go into August, it seems to have completely sputtered out. But these attacks have utterly bled Ukraine white. The Ukrainian forces are really in terrible shape. They're a skeletal version of what they were just a year ago. We think that uh, the Ukrainians have lost somewhere between 300 and 350,000 dead, maybe more. 
hundreds of thousands of wounded. So now we're at a turning point. And I would argue that this is probably the most dangerous point in this crisis and conflict that we faced because Ukraine is on the verge of collapse. And the great concern that I always had at the beginning of this war was that when this happens, and this was inevitable because Ukraine was never in a position to take on Russia, you're talking about a nation of 34.5 million people fighting a nation of 140 million. And we grossly underestimated Russia. We didn't understand its economic power, the abundance of food and resources at its disposal. We didn't understand that their scientific industrial base was still largely intact and that they could rapidly scale up and provide their forces not only with good equipment, but new equipment, modern equipment. And I'm sure you'll recall that people kept saying, well, the Russians are running out of this. The Russians are running out of that. The Russians never ran out of anything, but the Ukrainians have now run out of everything. They've run out of most of their artillery ammunition, tank ammunition, even small arms, and they're running out of human beings. The question is, what do we do now? What do you do when you realize that the bet you've made on this proxy called Ukraine has failed? Mm -hmm. That you created a monster now that didn't exist in February 2022. The Russian armed forces are not simply growing they're continuing to expand at a very rapid rate. There are at least 750,000 troops in the western part of Russia now, as well as in Ukraine. We're looking at another 250 to 500,000 showing up in the near future. So it's not unreasonable to expect that by the fall, maybe the winter, you'll have at least 1.2 million or 1.3 million troops under arms in Russia. And Russia is better armed, better equipped, better trained, better commanded, more modern than it has been certainly since the 1980s. So what do you do? Do you take risk? Do you decide, well, maybe I'll test the waters. Maybe we'll let the Poles and the Lithuanians stick their toe in the water and see how far they get in Western Ukraine. Then if there's a problem, well, then maybe we'll help them. And if there isn't, maybe we'll follow with our forces. You'll recall somebody, I think his name is Petraeus, talked about a coalition of the willing in the fall last year. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're staring at right now. It's mm -hmm. very dangerous because Russia is stronger than ever. We are not. We are not the nation of 1991. Our armed forces are not in great shape. Our ships are not in great shape. Our aircraft need a lot of maintenance, a lot of replacement. The army is in, I would argue, is in terrible condition. We don't have a large enough army. We don't have enough ammunition for them. The fuel problem is, is enormous. There isn't the logistical infrastructure in the European theater that you need if you're going to fight a long conflict. So things do not look good on our side, but you have this very serious case of self-delusion in Washington. Mm. And that is that every time the Ukrainians announce that they've done something, 95% of the time, it turns out to be a lie. But every time the Ukrainians say, well, we, we attack 10 kilometers, six miles. Uh, we seize this village which they, if they got that far, they almost lost immediately. And we're making progress. And everybody in the Pentagon, everybody in London and the Ministry of Defense, everybody in Brussels is running around with their hair on fire saying, the Ukrainians are winning, the Ukrainians are winning, which of course is absurd. Yeah. But these kinds of delusions loom large right now. Washington lives in a bubble on every level, and they think things are better than they are in Ukraine. Very, very dangerous. So I think we are now at that point where if we're not careful, foolish people in Brussels and Washington and London could actually commit U.S. and other NATO forces directly into this conflict and end up facing the Russians, which I think would be a disaster for Europe. It's interesting as well, because you hit on this and we, we had a conversation on the show with with uh, Tony Schaefer about this previously. Like, I feel like when it's been impossible to get actual real updates other than listening to people like yourself discussing what's happening. It just feels like it's not even a fog of war. It's just a fog of propaganda. It's impossible for a regular person to make a decision. And I guess looking at that, like, where do we go from here then? Because it feels like there is no way to even get news on the subject. Well, you're right. The mainstream media deliberately lies, <clears throat> not just about this, but a whole range of things. There, There is now no truth. There is simply a narrative. And if you don't pick up the narrative and uh, tout it, then you're the enemy. You're a Putin agent. Yes. Or you're any number of other evil things that the left, which now dominates Washington and controls the swamp, detests. 
uh, it's it's not a, there's no easy solution. But Americans, strangely enough, have not paid very much attention to what's happening in Ukraine. It's only a, 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 a really a, a fraction of the population of the electorate that pays much attention. And that's bad because when you don't pay attention to these kinds of things, they sneak up on you. Mm-hmm. There are very few Americans who are aware of what's really happening and were ever interested. What if they woke up in a week or two and discovered that NATO was in a fighting match with Russia? Because that would that would change everything. The Russians have exercised remarkable restraint. They have deliberately held back. One of the reasons they've been holding back was, first of all, they hoped that we would come back and negotiate. And secondly, because they don't want a war with the United States or NATO. I mean, they're rational. (laughs) Yes. We're the ones who are not rational. We're the ones that don't seem to understand. That's a very dangerous proposition. They understand Mm -hmm. that because they know it could rapidly escalate to the nuclear level. Now, why? Well, if you don't have the military power on the ground, I'm talking about the high-end conventional military power to take on your opponent, and we don't, what do you risk? You risk an escalation to the nuclear level, particularly if you lose, Mm -hmm. which we would if we went toe-to-toe with the Russians on a conventional level. No one wants that. The Russians don't want that. They just want to negotiate an end to this thing, and we won't do it. And that means that they don't have any choice but to do what? March west. They'll have to march to the Dnieper River and then potentially cross that river and march eventually all the way to the Polish border. This was never the intention. It's not their goal. It's not their preference. But if you don't talk to these people and you stonewall them and you continue to believe that you are superior to them, that you can do things better than they can, that you can win a war in the in the case of the United States, what, 8,000 miles, 7,000 miles away from home, with a fraction of the troops that you need, well, good luck with that approach. I don't think it'll work, and I think it could get us into a lot of trouble. Well, you mentioned NATO and what's been happening with NATO. Um, there was kind of through this whole conflict, there's been the, the dragging on thing with will Ukraine be be led into to NATO? And then the, the vote happens, and Zelensky was kind of left like the girl stood up on prom night where there was nobody there for him. And I guess Looking looking at that situation, like how does NATO come out of this? Because it does seem like NATO has been posturing. There's a, a video that's been going around the Internet, which shows the development of NATO countries and how they pop up year after year after year, kind of over the last 20 years to show how much closer they've gotten to Russia. So not that I agree with Putin, but at the same time, I can see why the guy's gotten angry. Right. You know, you keep getting closer to his door. So how does NATO come out of this? And, and where do you see that going from here? Right now, the great danger to us is that the Polish tail will wag the American dog. In other words, it's your small allies that are filled with hostility and hatred for Russia will find a way to drag us into a war that we really don't want to fight. That's very important to understand. Mm -hmm. This is the problem with Europe. The European states are by no means uh, uniform in their hostility to Russia there is very little support among most of the European electorates in France and Germany, Scandinavia, Italy, Spain for a war with Russia. I, mean, I, I have missed it if it's happened, but I haven't seen hundreds of thousands of volunteers marching through the streets demanding to be enlisted and armed to go fight Russia. That has It seems like it's more like top down rather than bottom up, like it's the leaders yeah, deciding this, not the people. Absolutely. And remember, the globalist elites rule in Europe just as they rule here. And they've all gotten where they are with the aid and assistance of enormous quantities of money because the people that control your financial markets and financial institutions, the people that control your mainstream media, they now control your governments. And they don't represent the interests of any of the Europeans, and I would argue of most Americans. They represent their own interests and their agenda is to destroy Russia. Now, why? Well, they'd like to replace Putin because Putin presides over the last major power in Europe, and it is part of Europe, that has uh, a national identity, a national language, a national culture that Mm -hmm. rests on the foundation of Orthodox Christianity. That makes Russia the enemy of the globalists. What have the globalists done to us? What have the globalists done to the people in Western and much of Europe? 
Well, they flooded our countries with non-Europeans with the specific goal of diluting us, weakening us, destroying our national identity, eliminating our national culture, certainly expunging any remain, uh, remaining power that Christianity may wield culturally inside the West. And they want to do that to Russia because Russia has a bonus resources, enormous resources, mineral resources, agricultural resources, and obviously oil, gas, and many other rare metals. These things are also at the top of the agenda. So if you can destroy the Russian government, if you can remove Putin, if you can get into Russia, you can strip it of its resources and enrich yourself that much further than you've already done by your behavior over the last several, I would argue, decades. So that's where we are. And that's why Russia has to go. Russia's holding out. But how does this affect the dollar's dominance then? Because I, I think, frankly, if you look at a lot of what the Biden administration does has done, they've shown people don't trust the U.S. dollar, don't spend in it. And we've actually kind of forced these countries to unite under BRICS. And I, I guess from your your viewpoint, where do you see the, the dollar and the U.S. economy going from here? Because if we lose our dollar, our economy is done. Well, keep in mind that the institutions we have, whether it's SWIFT or the World Bank or any number of these large financial institutions, have taken years to develop. So they're not going to go away quickly. They, they will be with us for some time. So will the dollar. However, much of the world, and when I say much of the world, I'm talking about out of what, 137 countries, probably 80 plus, mm -hmm. are sick to death of the United States. Now, why are they sick of us? Is it because we've invaded other people's countries and bullied them? Well, partially. But it's because we've used the financial system to bully people. If you don't do what we think you ought to do, and you happen to be living in Nigeria, or Chad, or Algeria, or Nicaragua, or Venezuela, or Chile, or Brazil, well, we can punish you. We can make sure that loans from the World Bank don't show up. We can make sure that if you don't grow the crops we tell you to grow, that your crops are going to rot in the fields because no one will buy them from you. In other words, the dollar is part of the arsenal of weapons that we use to enforce our discipline, our notion of a world order. And our notion of a world order is unambiguously American hegemony and dominance of everything. Remember, this all goes back to Madeleine Albright, who was very famous for telling uh, Bell, uh, you know, we're the exceptional nation. Nothing can happen on this planet without our participation. You keep talking about this thing you call the military and how great it is. Well, why can't we use it? And Madeline managed to use it. And her successors have used it. It's been used repeatedly to advance our interests at the expense of others. So Putin has a very, uh, let us say, receptive audience. He's seen as someone who has stood up to us. He's seen as someone who won't be bullied. And in the meantime, he and the Chinese and India have all worked tirelessly to accumulate enormous stores of gold. Many other nations have done something similar, but not on the same scale. And their argument is, in order to get out from under the dollar, from under this fiat currency, which truthfully has no real value, because it's not pegged to anything, mm -hmm. is to go back to gold and peg everything to gold. Now, I think that's happening very slowly, and it will take a few years, but it's coming. And those states will avoid dealing with us. They will either go to a new currency that is pegged to gold, or they will peg their own currencies to gold. I'm not sure which. I think they'll try to go to a new currency. And that'll make it easier for them to do business, because right now, if you don't do business in dollars, it's very hard to move goods and services around the globe. And they really have to build up the system to do what we do anyway. So it's going to take some time. But this means that over time, the dollar, which has already lost a lot of value, as you know, uh, the dollar is, is going to be replaced mm -hmm. by something else. A basket of currencies, a, a gold-pegged currency, digital currency, any number of things. It, it's coming. But it's mm -hmm. not coming overnight.
Well, I just had to have some car repairs done the other day, and it's been the first major repairs I've had done in a while. And I was like, wow, why did their hourly rate go up so much? Because it's kind of the first Volkswagen I've had since 2007. So I took a look at the dollar, and it's actually lost 51 cents in value just since 2007. So to me, seeing how much kind of the money printing and things like that is is killing us here, it, it's quite obvious, even you know, as a business owner, like I have to pay my employees more though my profits haven't gone up. Of course. Uh, inflation is killing everybody. And of course, if you come to Washington, it's not a problem. Inflation is falling. You know, the stock market's up. All of us here in Washington, I mean, the elites and their friends in New York City, we're all making lots of money. What's the problem? Uh, there's a wonderful depiction of this kind of uh, uh, disconnect between the population and the people ruling them in this film called Dr. Shivago. And it shows uh, thousands of Russian citizens demonstrating in the streets, singing and asking, uh, you know, the, the government to listen to their grievances. And on the second floor or third floor of a very posh uh, building, there's a restaurant full of hundreds of people that are enjoying all the best things in life. And they're celebrating and somebody says, well, hopefully these poor fools out in the street will sing in tune after the revolution. And they all laugh. Well, this, this is kind of what's happening here. It's not just here. It's also happening in Europe. I mean, Germany is deindustrializing. Their standard of living is falling through the floor. This is Germany, one of the powerhouses of, of all time, one of, the, one of the greatest producers of technology the world has ever seen. And what's, what's happening to it? It's being systematically destroyed. The Russians didn't destroy it. Their government is destroying it with a combination of bad policies uh, supporting the stupid war on Russia, which is unjust and unnecessary, and uh, their self-inflicted green wound by trying to go to some form of energy that is not yet developed and isn't validated. In the meantime, they're shut, they've already shut down all their nuclear power plants. They can't power all of their uh, power plants as it is because they don't have cheap energy, which is the always, always historically... Uh, what is critical to any successful civilization. So I think we can sit here today and I think we can say, Ryan, you know, over the next few years, we're going to see all the politicians that are in charge in the West swept away. Mm -hmm. That includes our own. Everything is going to be swept away and people are going to start over. That I think is the long-term outcome. The question is, can we get there without this war developing into a larger regional conflict that could destroy more lives, more property, and potentially drag us in and put our country at risk. So if you had a crystal ball in that, how do you see them handling it? Do you think they keep us out of that conflict? or do they? Do, to me, their actions say they drive us deeper into it, but where do you think we go from here? It, it depends uh, on who ultimately emerges triumphant on the inside of the administration. Now, you have the ideologically committed globalists. These are the people that want open borders. These are the people that don't want to enforce the rule of law inside the United States. They want to release criminals onto our streets. You know, the people that back the George Soros attorneys and their bizarre interpretation of the law, which favors criminals over citizens. These people also want this war to be prosecuted with a vengeance. They want Russia to be destroyed. We know who they are. Uh, they're prominent, they wield great power, but at the same time, there are some sober-minded individuals who are saying, look, you know, this could in fact get out of control. We may not be able to manage this. We need to bring it to an end. And remember in their minds, they're also thinking about future elections. And they're saying, perhaps we should bring this to a halt before next year. Otherwise, the elections will end up talking all about the war, and that will come at the expense of those of us who want to perpetuate our rule in Washington. In fact, the outrage directed at us by the American people could become so great that we can't cheat our way through the next election and stay in power. So I think that's also the conversation that's being had. Well, I heard you mentioned um, on Patrick Bed David's show that you you had an idea that there may not be elections in 2024. Do you still have that thought process or, or what brings you there? Well, my point was that the process may be distorted and by distorted, it could be postponed or depending upon what happens in Washington, if the government should fall apart. I mean, if you had the president who suddenly steps down, 
I don't see much evidence for support for the vice president taking over. Conceivably, we could go through a period of rather significant turmoil until things sort themselves out, at least temporarily. That may require election sooner or, or later than originally planned. And then again, there are a lot of Americans who no longer trust the electoral process. You know, I, I've said this before, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia. I know North Philadelphia well. I saw elections there from, the, you know, consciously because my mother was very involved in politics. And in 1960, she was a judge of elections. And we watched that election stolen. Wow. It was stolen in 1960. The difference between the steal in 1960 and what's happened here recently is that Richard Nixon decided, I'm not going to contest this, even though there was a, a mountain of evidence that the election had been stolen, particularly in Philadelphia, Chicago, New York City, Boston, places like this, where we've always had large numbers of dead people vote on election day. We used to call election day resurrection day. That's how much. My, my father-in-law is from Mayfair, so he says that quite often. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, Nixon said, well, the reason I'm not going to contest it, though, is that I know the country will be safe in the hands of President Kennedy, because President Kennedy is a patriot. He, he loves the country. The country will be safe. Well, now I think people are looking at this government and the things that they are doing at home as well as overseas. And I think there are large numbers of Americans. I can't possibly know how many millions of them there are, but enough out there that uh, are concerned about the people governing us, that that would no longer carry weight with them. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if you run into this sort of crisis, which I think could happen at any time, and as with all crises, they get much worse when the economy tanks, you see. And that's why you keep you, you hear people say, well, we've got to tighten or we have got to raise interest rates. But then people say, well, if you're going to raise interest rates, you have to cut spending. Oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. So we're going to print more money. We're going to buy more treasuries that we can't afford to buy. We're going to weaken, as you pointed out earlier, the value and the credibility of the dollar system. But at the same time, we're going to raise interest rates. Well, how do you make this work? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's there's no kind growth. Of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. But I think the party is going to go on until the last minute. I think people will party and party and party and drink their champagne and spend their money and buy their yachts and their big cars and live in the houses they do in Washington until it all falls apart. Well, Colonel McGregor, one final question for you, because I know uh, you have you have you're tight on time. But the, the, the one of the big things we try to talk about in the show is, yes, the, the world is a scary place. You know, politics can be difficult. And for the regular person, it can feel disempowering. But I guess for someone listening. You know, how can they feel at least a little bit causative in their life based on what we've talked about here, in your opinion? Listen, that's an important question. And I know lots of people are asking that. And what we lack on the right and have lacked for a very long time is effective organization. All you have to do is go back to the election in 2020. You show up at a polling uh, station and there are 40 or 50 lawyers working for the Democratic Party there doing everything in their in their power legally to obstruct the people on the right uh, from casting votes or influencing the counting or showing evidence for uh, fair and above board counting. And who was there from the right? There was nobody. There's nobody there, one or two volunteers. That won't work. So we need an organization that reaches from the bottom to the top on the right. We need people organized at the local level to fight against the corruption, to demand proper action. That means that we have to get the same kind of guns on our side that the Democrats have been using for years. And that means you have to have legal advice, legal protection, and a legal offense to defend yourself against these people. Then there has to be leadership. Where, where is the leadership? Mm -hmm. uh, virtually everyone in Washington at this point is compromised. There are very few people who are not compromised. Most Americans look at these people and they re they say, well, how could they have voted for this? They're supposed to be Republicans. You pick any bill. This was a bill from the left. Well, that's because the Republicans are not really who they claim to be. And everyone has his handout or her handout. They're stuffing cash into their pockets. 
And it's a very convoluted system that allows people to donate to political action committees to ensure people are elected to do what they want. But the bottom line is it's corruption. And the swamp is is chock full of everybody. Mm -hmm. And people will tell you who are in the swamp. You know, I didn't come here to join the swamp, but I figured out that if I didn't join, I couldn't survive. I, I've heard that from so many congressmen. If I don't take the money, somebody else will, and I'll be out of office. Because the, the people that own Washington, uh, the donors, they'll donate to your opponent if you don't do what they want you to do. If you vote some way they don't like, well, we'll we'll get you out in the next primary. I'll find somebody else that will do what I tell them. Mm -hmm. So that's why you, you take somebody like DeSantis. DeSantis made a statement. It was a very legitimate statement. He was asked about Ukraine. He said, look, the United States has no vital strategic interests in eastern Ukraine. We should not be involved in this war. Correct. Absolutely right. I, right. I, I know a great deal about the region. I grew up with large numbers of Ukrainians and Poles and others. We don't want any part of this place. This You have a thousand years of conflict and war and fighting that we don't understand and can't even begin to grasp. So we shouldn't be there. He was right. And what did he do two days later? He came, well, I spoke hastily. I think it's important that we support Ukraine and Ukraine wins this war for democracy. Well, where did that come from? His donors called and said, you know, we support this war. You said the wrong things. Well, he wants the checks to come in so that he can run for office. He changed his position. That's why it's so hard for anybody who does not follow the DeSantis model to get into politics, get elected, and do anything. Yes. And right now, I mean, uh, you know, other than Donald Trump, who's got enormous problems because obviously he's he's being persecuted on a scale that no previous president has witnessed, certainly since uh, President Johnson, uh, who was the vice president under Lincoln, who was ridiculed and subjected to incredible misfortune. Other than him, the only person out there who's making any sense, who's talking truthfully is JFK Jr. or RFK Jr. Mm -hmm. He is. What what Bobby Kennedy hasn't figured out is that his party is gone. Yes. The political spectrum, in my opinion, is completely realigned. It doesn't exist anymore. Well, his party is gone. And by the way, the Republican Party is gone. Yes. You, you know, we people just have to understand these parties don't represent them anymore and could care less about them. The sooner they come to terms with that, the sooner we can get going and elect somebody else. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons why I always argue whenever I can for a third party. And people look at me and say, well, that's really hard. No, it's not. Yes, you do need some money in order to support the effort to get on the ballot in, in all 50 states, but that can be done. Uh, you do need big donors to stand up who, who care, who are interested in the country. Yeah, we can find some of them. It can be done. But it's the American people themselves that have to demonstrate they will no longer pay attention to these two parties. But in order for them to do that, we got to give them an alternative, which goes back to my point on where's the organization and where's the leadership. Mm -hmm. Well, Colonel McGregor, I, I appreciate your time so much today, sir. Um, for people listening, if they want to connect with you or find out more about your work, where's going to be the best place for our listeners to go, sir? Listen, you just you can Google on YouTube. Uh, I've got a website uh, there, by the way. Uh, there are lots of fake uh, Facebook sites. I warn people, be careful because they use my material. Uh, and if they ask you for money, forget it. I never ask for money and I'm not selling anything. So if I'm not asking for money and I'm not selling anything and somebody else is, forget it, throw it out, don't talk to them. But, you know, you you can find my works anywhere on, on, the, on the internet. Uh, it's not hard. Very cool. Well, Colonel Douglas McGregor, thank you so much for your time today, sir. Hey, thank you. Bye-bye.